Good morning and welcome to New Testament Survey, PC 103. Recording is started. <clears throat> so let's pray even before we could begin with our session. Can I request one of you all to please pray? Karen, Anand, friends, anyone? <clears throat> You'll, yeah, Prince, please yeah. go ahead. Jesus, uh, Lord, uh, we come to you, Lord Father, this morning, uh, remembering of your grace, oh Lord Father, remembering of your goodness over our Lord Jesus, as we are going to study about your word, oh Lord Father. Help us uh, to understand everything that you are teaching us, oh Lord Father. Lord, uh, we surrender our minds, we surrender our hearts, Lord Father. Into your hands, Holy Spirit, God, come and have your ways in us. And help us open our ears, open our eyes, of our heart, of our mind, to see uh, the greater and uh, wonderful things of you. And uh, help us to learn more and come closer to you, Jesus. We surrender everything into your precious hands. Come and have your ways. In Jesus' mighty precious name we pray. Amen. 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 Good morning. Good morning once again, and thank you so much for joining in. So last class, we were studying on the book of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew. Let me share the presentation. So where did we stop last class? Anyone remember? Where did we stop last class? Anyone from the class? What did what way we starting on? The comparison between Matthew, uh, Mark, Luke, and John. Like, how does they say the kingdom genealogy about Matthew and Mark and Luke's as kingdom of God? So, yeah. Thanks. Check it. Anyone else from the class? We, uh, did we lastly study on the things that marked the book as the book of Kings? Were we there? <clears throat> and covering these points that are seen on the screen? Where we, uh, talked about the uh, where we talked about the several elements from the Gospel of Matthew that classifies the book as the book of Kings. Like the Old Testament prophets who declare that Messiah would come as a king and and you know we started looking into uh, the gospel of matthew as uh, in in, uh, in the beginning of the chapter matthew chapter 1 verse 1 can we all turn to matthew chapter 1 verse 1 it says the book of the genealogy of jesus christ the son of david the son of abraham the son of David and son of Abraham. And we see uh, it talks about the genealogy of Jesus, the lineage of Jesus, because Matthew showcases Jesus or Matthew portrays Jesus as the king. And second uh, point, we saw that Jesus kingly visit. When we turn to Matthew chapter 2, when we read from you know, uh, verse 1 to 12, we see that uh, <clears throat> we see that the baby Jesus is visited by the three, uh, the, by the wise men or the kingly figures from the east. Not only these, these uh, uh, kings pay homage to Jesus, they gave him a present. The three kingly gifts were presented. I has I requested the class to let me know what those these three gifts denotes: the gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Did anyone went and looked it? Do you all know what does these three gifts denotes? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh.
Okay, for tomorrow's class, I want you all to do this. Okay, I want you all to go. Okay, Nina Santosh has looked in. Okay, Nina, can you please let us know what are these three gifts denotes? Gold, frankincense, and Ma, you can unmute and share. Yeah, gold as a symbol of kingship and frankincense as a symbol of deity or an incense which used for embalming and frankincense because of worship um, identity as a son of god amen amen thank you thank you nina thank you so much for sharing that with the class yes so matthew is only gospel that records all these kingly events and then the third point we looked as jesus kingly title when we read matthew chapter 2 verse 2 saying where is he who has been born king of jews for we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him so we see the wise men come from the east to worship him and also in in uh, uh, chapter 27 verse 37 I'm turning to Matthew 27. Matthew chapter 27, verse 37. Can anyone read if you have taken it? <coughs> and they put up over his head the accusation written against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Thank you, thank you, Rin. It says, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. The kingly title has been given by the people. And the fourth point we also see here is Jesus' kingly function. So where do we see that? Matthew chapter 2, verse 6. Can we turn to Matthew chapter 2, verse 6? <coughs> If you have taken, you can read Matthew chapter 2, verse 6. But, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the ru rulers of Judah. For out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Amen. Thank you. So it says, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people. So you see the kingly function. With that, we will move on to the next slide. Jesus, kingly forerunner. So in those days, like we looked even in the last class, that in those days, it was a custom where, uh, that when a king is traveling through his domain, that a crier, one who cries, who brings forth a cry, will come before him to prepare the way, giving people uh, time to get ready for his arrival. That that uh, and and the people, people in that place would pay a due respect, a due homage for him for his actual arrival. So we see in Matthew chapter three, verse one to three, it says, "In those days, John the Baptist came." Teaching in the wilderness of Judah and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, that a voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. So it was a customary act that God fulfilled it in the life of Jesus according to the custom that Jesus was born in. And with that, we see the next point, Jesus' kingly law. So we turn to Matthew chapter 5, verse 22. Matthew chapter 5, verse 22. If you have taken, you can read. Uh, what I, I say, I say Jesus. to you that whoever is angry with his brother, Without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment, and whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, you fool, 
shall be in danger of hellfire. Thank you. So the kingly law. So what we see in this gospel here is Jesus is seen as the king of the kingdom. So one of his first official act in this reign of righteousness is to go up to a mountain, sit down and deliver a message which subjects the law that he gives to govern this kingdom. So the key phrase you see here is, you have heard it said of those of the old, but I say, but I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. So he is giving certain laws to the people who are sitting there saying, this is my kingdom and I'm your king and this is the kingly laws that I'm giving for it. And later we also see Jesus' kingly connection. Where do we see that Jesus' kingly connection? Let's turn to Matthew chapter 12 verse 3. Matthew chapter 12, verse 3, we see that. But he said to them, have you not read what David did when he was hungry? He and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and ate the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for them. So he just, because he was hungry, he went in and ate the bread that was provided. But what we notice in this, in chapter 12, verse 3 is several times in this gospel, the gospel of Matthew, that Jesus is clearly linked to King David, that he is the son of David. And later we see the next point, Jesus' kingly manifestation. If we turn to chapter 17, Matthew chapter 17, and when we read through the uh, verse, like from verse 1 to 13, which talks about Jesus' transfiguration on the mount. So on the mount of transfiguration, we see the glory of the Son was manifested by the Father. So the mountains in the scripture represent kingdom. When I, when I speak about this particular passage, and here when it talks about the mountain, it talks about Jesus kingdom and the last point that we have listed here is jesus kingly apparel crowns kept up let's turn to matthew chapter 27 mm, yeah matthew chapter 27 verse yeah, minute yes yeah, verse 27 to verse 30 or 31 where it talks about uh, uh about the soldiers who mock Jesus, they mock at him. So, through because of time frame, I'll just briefly explain what the scripture talks about. It talks about where the soldiers who were involved in the crucifixion were mocking Jesus and they gave him a purple robe to wear. Uh, so, that purple robe denotes the royalty and crowned it with the crown of thorns and put a scepter in his hand. And little that they knew that he would one day be the judge of all men and rule with a scepter of righteousness. So this is what this uh, scripture talks about. With that, let me <coughs> turn the slide. So next we will look at how Jesus demonstrated the authority of the kingdom of God through this book of Matthew. So Matthew portrays Jesus uh, as you know, who's having all power and authority. When we read uh, Matthew 28, verse 18, the last few verses, okay? Let me read that all three, Matthew 18, 19, and 20. Matthew chapter 28, that's the last chapter, last three verse, 18, 19, and 20. It talks about Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of this age. So what we see here, Jesus showing that he has a supreme power over heaven and over earth. He has people throughout the gospel. When we read, we see that Jesus has been portrayed, that he has this authority. He has this power over people, over every kind of sickness and disease. 
and over uh, you know the blindness leprosy lepers but healed and he also had the power over the wind and the waves they come down at the very word of jesus we see he also said he has the power over the temple that he will rebuild the temple in three days and we know what was he talking about he had the power over sin where he spoke to the man who was paralytic he said your sins have been forgiven get up and take your bed and walk so he had the power immediately the person who was paralyzed he was lying on the bed he did get up he did carry his bed and he walked and then we see he had power over the demons the demons flew at the very sight of jesus at the very presence of him we see that he had the authority over the nature history human destiny and almost everything because this scripture which which we just read uh, 28 18 says that jesus had the power he had all authority was given to him in heaven and on earth in heaven and on earth so with that these were the certain facts that we need to remember when we study through the gospel of matthew okay so with that i uh, let me give you a story format of uh, uh, we we remember it's easy for us to remember the gospel of matthew just give me a minute let me change the slide let me share that yeah so from the gospel of matthew I request you all to please read through this book so that we remember each and every act. So I just uh, uh, I thought I can summarize few events from this book so that we remember the form of story. So it is one of the uh, earliest official accounts that Jesus about Jesus of Nazareth, which talks about his life, death, and resurrection. And the author of this book. That the Gospel of Matthew is Matthew, a Levite, and he was also a tax collector who was one of the twelve apostles. So the tradition says that for about thirty to forty years, the apostles orally taught and passed on the eyewitness account about Jesus, along with his teaching that they had also memorized. So the stories were told and retold again and again for about thirty to forty years. So we see that Matthew had then collected and arranged all these amazing tapestries, and he designed the book to highlight certain themes about Jesus. So from the last session, we studied that the Matthew wanted to show how Jesus uh, continued to fulfill the whole. Uh, the calling on his life. So we see that uh, Matthew portrays uh, three things very importantly. Three things in the Gospel of Matthew. The first we see that he shows that Jesus is a Messiah from the line of David. By you know there is an introduction and there is a conclusion in this book. So the the way he, he introduced Jesus, he clearly mentioned that Jesus is the Messiah from who is from the line of David. And the second point, he also says that he is a new authoritative teacher like Moses, by quoting many scriptures from the Old Testament. And then the third point, he makes it very clear to us is that he shows Jesus as Emmanuel. The Hebrew word Emmanuel means God is with us. So the very book. Which started with the introduction, which gives the genealogy for a king. He also has a conclusion, a beautiful conclusion, by giving a great commission to the people. So Matthew opened the book with genealogy about Jesus, where he highlights about Jesus uh, the messiah, uh, the messianic line uh, of the son of David, and he also said he's son of Abraham. That means. That he's going to do, or going to bring God's blessing to all the nation. The 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 promise that God uh, promised to Abraham in Genesis chapter twelve, verse one, two, and three. We see that I will bless you, bless your generation. I'll make your name great through you. I will bless the nations. So that's why Matthew also 
uh, in the genealogy, he brings the genealogies that Jesus is the son of David and he's a son of Abraham. And after that, we get to see that very famous story in narrates about the birth of Jesus. Just give me a minute. Somebody has commented. Yes, thanks, Nina. Thank you. So we got the clarification of the three gifts. Yes, frankincense is for the priesthood. He's the high priest and murder is connected to the sacrifice. Okay. Back to our story form, talking about the genealogy. So where we put genealogy to the the son of David and son of Abraham. And then we also see all the events from the Old Testament of which the prophets had promised that the nation would come and honor the Messiah were fulfilled in Jesus. Matthew also shows that Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. But even more than that, we see that Jesus' connection by the Holy Spirit, his name is Emmanuel. All these work put together show us that Jesus is not an ordinary man, but he is God with us. He is Emmanuel. God became man. So we see that two things that Matthew brings, two key themes right at the introduction. One, he is from the lineage of David. Second, he is Emmanuel, God with us. But Matthew also wants to show us how Jesus is the new Moses. There is a comparison in this book for Jesus and Moses. So through the reference of uh, many uh, Old Testament scriptures that he relates Matthew relates it to Jesus. So one of the comparison we see that he relates him to Moses. So like Moses, Jesus came out of Egypt. Then he passed through the water of baptism and he entered into the wilderness for 40 days. And then Matthew narrates it that Jesus you know, uh, goes up to a mountain to deliver his new teaching. Here what he's talking about is uh, teaching on the Sermon of on the Mount, Sermon on the Mount. So through all this, what is Matthew trying to claim? Matthew is trying to claim that Jesus is the promised Messiah. Or he also comparing, by comparing Moses to Jesus, he is showcasing that Jesus is greater than Moses' figure, who is going to deliver Israel from the slavery. He is going to give them the new divine teaching. He is going to save them from their sin and bring them, bring them a new covenant relationship between God and His people. So after Jesus uh, uh, beginning to heal uh, people, uh, I mean, he, he started to do his ministry by healing, delivering people. We see that he takes the followers out of the mountain on a hillside and he delivers that first sermon called the Sermon on the Mount. And here we see that Jesus shares on what it looks like to follow him and live according to God's kingdom. So he's teaching them the practical way. What is actually expected? What is expected from God? So he, he teaches them, you know, the kingdom of God. When we talk about the kingdom of God, it is the upside kingdom where there are no privileged members. We are all on the same level ground. We are all equal in the eyes of God. Because there was a lot of partiality led by the people, by the Pharisees, scribes and others. So here Jesus is teaching there are no privileged members in the kingdom of God. So what we see, we see uh, 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 who came to hear the sermon of Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount. We see everyone, especially we see that the poor was there, the nobodies. There were no wealthy people, the wealthy or the religious. Everyone came, everyone were invited to listen to the teaching of Jesus, where they could repent and follow him and join his family. And here we also see that during this uh, uh, 
during this journey of Jesus moving from one place to another, uh, the way he taught them. You see, wherever Jesus went, there was a large crowd following Jesus. And we see Matthew records two times that Jesus miraculously provided food for this huge crowd in the desert. Once it was for 5,000, and second it was for 7,000. So one of which is Jewish and the other is non-Jewish people among the crowd. They were both type of people. And this is a sign, a very similar sign to what Moses did for Israel in the wilderness is by, by providing the food. And here we also see Jesus clarifies to the Pharisees and the other religious leaders who say that he is not here to set aside, uh, you know, they were uh, continuously saying that he is not here fulfilling the Old Testament uh, uh, covenant or fulfilling the Old Testament Torah. But then Jesus makes sure that I am not here. I'm not here to set aside the commands of the Torah or the Old Testament, but rather I'm here to fulfill that through the life and through the teaching. So here we also see that Jesus transformed the hearts of people through the teaching so that they can truly love God and love their neighbor, including the enemy. So the minute, uh, the way he taught people, they, he, he noticed that their hearts was transformed, their hearts was turning towards God. And that's when Jesus gives this new commandment, love your God with all your heart, all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Being said that Matthew also records in uh, records about the call of the twelve, how Jesus called the twelve disciples, and then how he extends his reach by sending them out. That's what the book ends at, you know, commissioning the great commission. And these twelve disciples could be doing what they saw Jesus did. In fact, we see that Matthew narrates a bunch of Jesus' parables about the kingdom of heaven, like about a farmer throwing a seed on four types of soil, about a mustard seed and a pearl or a buried treasure. So through these parables, we see the commentary on the stories that we can read in um, chapter 11. 11 and 12, we see many parables were narrated, and Matthew also collects a group of stories of how people are portraying Jesus has two ways, some of the ways. Okay, some people portray Jesus as positive, like you know, uh, they uh, people love Jesus, they think that he is the Messiah, but at the same time, there were others like John the Baptist was neutral. Is he the Jesus? Is he the Messiah whom we are waiting for? Or even at the extreme side, uh, we can't say only John the Baptist, even Jesus' own family had the same doubt within them that is he the Messiah? Is he the one whom we are waiting for? And along with that, we also see that there were other people who were very negative were very negative, like the Israel leaders, where the Pharisees, the scribes of the Bible, scholars, they rejected Jesus altogether. They thought that he is a false teacher, is lead is misleading the people. Uh, they, uh, they, they thought that he is blasphemous by making himself exalted, claim like he is a son of God. One thing through this, we notice that Jesus isn't surprised, a throne of these responses. So uh, <clears throat> when we turn to chapter 16, when we turn to chapter 16, we see in verse 13, okay, he just says, uh, Jesus asks his disciples, who do men say that I am, the son of man am? When he asked those questions to people, you see, Peter comes up with the right answer and says, Peter answered and said, verse 16, Jesus, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And verse 17, Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Verse 18, 
And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of faith shall not prevail against it. Okay, he goes on to say many things. But then what is very clear, something that we need to note here is that Peter's thought about a king is to somebody who can reign victoriously, like with the military power and who can rescue uh, the Jews from the Roman slavery and from the Roman government. But Jesus challenges Peter and says that, yes, I'm going to become a king, but in a different way. And then Jesus narrates to teach them from the prophet Isaiah, who said that the messianic king would suffer and die for the sins of his own people. And so Jesus positions himself as a messianic king. And he also sh uh, uh, showcases us that, you know, he will, he will reign by becoming a servant, would lay down his life for Israel and the nation. And mostly, the way Jesus taught them, I'm sure Peter and his disciples didn't get what Jesus was trying to say. But then Matthew records it. As uh, Matthew records it further, and he says, um, you know, Jesus teaching on the servanthood and servant leadership. So in the community of the servant king, we gain honor by serving others. And instead of taking revenge, we tend to forgive and do good to our enemies. This is what Jesus was trying to teach his disciples and also the people. So in Jesus' kingdom, we, uh, we gain true wealth by giving to poor. To follow the servant Messiah, we must become a servant for ourselves. So in the further chapters, okay, chapter 17 onwards, we see that Matthew records how Jesus comes to Jerusalem for a Passover, riding on a donkey, and the crowds are hailing at him as the Messiah. So Jesus immediately marches into the courtyard of the temple and he creates this um, uh, 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 courtyard of the temple and he creates this huge uh, 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 cures that, you know, uh, people were uh, uh, turning this temple into a marketplace. So we know what Jesus did. He took a whip and chased all the money lenders and he turned down the tables and he created it so that uh, he didn't want it, the place of worship to become a marketplace. Then Jesus withdraws with the disciples and then uh, he starts uh, uh, telling them what is, what is going to happen to him. He's going to be executed by these leaders. Um, is going to somebody let me finish what I'm saying? Somebody has raised a hand. Okay. Yeah, it was gone. So Jesus, you know, he is trying to tell what's going to happen to him after this slowly. And he also uh, shares with his disciples saying that he will be executed by these leaders. But in doing so, they are not going to create a downfall to his kingdom. But then Jesus is, uh, but Jesus is uh, preparing his leaders uh, to what is going to happen. So we also see that uh, there will be, uh, he is revealing that after his death, there will be a revolt against Rome. So Jerusalem and its temple are going to be destroyed. But Jesus says that this is not the end of the story. And it will be, uh, it, he is going to justify after his death and his resurrection, one day that he will return and set up his kingdom over all the nation and you know he's trying to teach all that and in the meanwhile he also takes his disciple okay that night jesus takes all his disciples aside and he tries to celebrate a passover meal with them so we remember right the passover what happens in that passover meal the passover meal is arranged in the upper room and uh, passover retells the story of israel's rescue from the slavery from the death of the Passover uh, talks about the death of the Passover lamb itself. And then Jesus takes the bread and the wine and he says that this is the meal, a new symbol, showing that his coming death would be sacrificed and he would redeem people from slavery to sin and evil. 
and um, Matthew narrates just immediately after that he narrates that so uh, that Jesus has been arrested he puts on a trial before the Sanhedrin the council of the Jewish leaders we know that right and they reject his claim to be the Messiah so what happened they charge him with blasphemy against God and then you see uh, Jesus is brought before the Roman Roman governor who's that Pilate and he thinks that Jesus is innocent but then he gives in to the pressure from these Jewish leaders on the other side who is forcing him to put Jesus to death by crucifixion. Now Jesus is led away by the Roman soldiers and eventually, long story cut short, that they crucified Jesus. Now what we notice here, we see that Matthew is opening another chapter and he's in, and he increases the number of references to the Old Testament survey. He's trying to show us that Jesus' death was not a tragedy or a failure. He is actually portraying that it is the fulfillment of the Old Testament promises. How? Jesus came as a servant Messiah spoken by the Isaiah. He was rejected by his own people. But instead of judging them, he is judged on their behalf, bearing the consequence of their sin. He also shows the crucifixion scene and uh, it, where it comes close that Jesus' body is now placed in the tomb. But the end of this book, is uh, it has a different story, the last chapter, where, uh, let me turn, 28. Yeah. So where we discover on one Sunday morning that Jesus' tomb is empty, the disciples, uh, they come and they witness that Jesus' tomb is empty and all of a sudden, people start to see Jesus alive from death. And here we see the book concludes with the risen Jesus giving his final teaching called the Great Commission. So Jesus says that he is now the true king of the world and so he sends his disciples out to all nations. That's what we read the Great Commission, right? In Matthew 28, verse 18, 19 and 20, he, he sends them to that Great Commission. Out to all nations, go proclaim the good news that Jesus is Lord and that anyone can join his kingdom by being baptized and by following his teaching. We also see that Matthew ends the book with a message of hope. What is that message of hope that Matthew gives us? It is nothing but Emmanuel, God with us. So from chapter 1 we see that the last words of Jesus in this book uh, that he is that I will be with you. It is a promise. Jesus promising all his 12 disciples because they were filled with great fear after the execution of Jesus. In fact, we all know the story that they all ran away back to their own uh, tradition or back to their own um, chores they were doing. But then Jesus called them, restored them back on the upper road. And it is a promise that Jesus gives that his presence will be with us until he finally returns. So this is the hope that Matthew ends this book. It's a very beautiful book, isn't it? He has a proper uh, start, introduction, and a conclusion with a great commission. So just uh, this uh, great commission is just not for his 12 disciples, or you know, uh, but it is for each of us. Each of us, this promise that God with us the Hebrew word Emmanuel is for each of us. Just like how Jesus commissioned his disciples and told them, go to the ends of the earth and proclaim the good news, baptize them, those who believe, baptize them, let them follow the teaching. It is the same great commission that Jesus is giving each of us through the Gospel of Matthew. So Matthew says that this is even for you. 
as you believe in Jesus, as you have set your life aside, this great commission is even for you. You are the disciple of Jesus. And also there's a promise, there's a message of hope that God is with us. He will never leave us and forsake us, that he is leading us. So as we study the Gospel of Matthew, we need to remember, we need to hold on to this promise, the Great Commission, that we are called, we are the chosen. We are to do what God has called us to do. If you have heard the uh, uh, sermon last Sunday and last two weeks, you see there is a call, there is a purpose each of us have in our life. We are not an accident, we are not here by chance, but there is a call, there is a purpose that we need to fulfill. What we need to do, we need to pray and ask God, God, for some of us, our call is clear. We know what God has called and we have started to prepare and move toward that direction. But for those who, for who are waiting to get this call of God clear, seek Him, Seek him till he reveals it. Our God is a God who does not do anything as a surprise or a secret, but then he reveals it to his children. He does not withhold any secret from his children. He is the first one to reveal it to his children. So it would be good for us to seek God day and night till it becomes clear to us, till his call becomes our purpose so that we can move towards that direction to fulfill God's call and His purpose in our life. So with that, I end this session. The class, uh, have any question or you would like to share anything, kindly unmute and share so that it would be a learning for all of us in the class. Anyone from the class would like to share? Okay, I would encourage you to study through the Gospel of Matthew so we understand the facts, what we studied, and we also will understand the parables. I have not covered each and every parable in detail. I left that for us to read. Okay. So do you all have any questions? Would you like to share what was your learning from this book, the first book of the New Testament survey? Anyone from the class? Very quiet. Anyone? Okay, maybe we should take this time to pray and close. Okay, we'll pray. Let me stop presenting. Okay. Father God, we thank you. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are a God, God of every power. You are Emmanuel. You are God with us. Thank you, Jesus, for the work that you did on the cross that you redeemed each one of us. You have restored us back to God. The relationship you have restored us so that we can look at the Father and call Abba Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for the great commission that you have called us, you have chosen us. Lord, I pray that you will reveal to each of us your call, your purpose, that we may follow you, that we may fulfill your call and purpose in our life. As we studied last semester, the fulfilling God's purpose, Lord, I pray that as we surrender ourselves and collaborate with you, Lord, I pray that you will strengthen each of us in our weakness and you will lead us. You will lead us in the path that will fulfill the call of God in our life. For those who have gone astray, Lord, I pray that you will bring us back to that first love. There will be a restoration. There will be a leading from you, O Lord, that you will lead us, you will guide us, you will strengthen us, O Father. Lord, even as we set this time aside to study your word, we pray that you will give us the mind of understanding, 
that we may understand your word, the purpose of it was written, and know the message for each of us personally of what you are revealing to us, to our heart, oh Father. Lord, I surrender each of us into your hands, Lord, that we, the, as we study each and every book and the letters, we pray that you will transform our life inside out to be more like Jesus. Lord, I pray that, Lord, this, the New Testament, the scripture will impact each of us, will change our lives, will transform us to be more like you. It will draw us close to you, Father, where we will encounter you, Lord, through the scriptures, that we will encounter you, that you are the true Messiah, the Son of God, who have redeemed us, who has set us aside, and here we are in you, Father. Lord, I pray that you will reign in and through us, Lord. Pray that you are our God, the revealed King, the Messiah, the true Messiah, Lord. We worship you, we love you, we honor you, we glorify your name, Lord. Thank you, Father, for who you are in us, Lord Jesus, that you are mindful of us, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you for revealing yourself to each one of us in the class and who would be watching, who are watching us online and later would be joining, Lord. I pray that, Lord, this book, this teaching will transform our mind and draw us close to you, where we encounter you, Lord. The true God is encountered, Lord. Each of us, from the place where we are, we are able to experience you, your power, your teaching, the God who has authority over the heaven and over the earth, Lord. Father, what is impossible by you, Lord? What is impossible by you, oh, Father? Lord, those who are listening to our teaching, oh Father, I pray that to those of, of us who feel that it is, it is impossible to have a transformed life, it is impossible to follow Jesus, Lord, I pray that, Lord, you will transform their heart, mind and thought, Lord. You will show them that God is with us. You are with them. They are not alone, oh Father. You are much closer than the breath that they breathe on. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for being much closer to them and transforming their heart, helping their heart, their mind, their spirit to have an encounter with your Father. May each and every session of this class, O oh Lord, will be an encounter with the Lord, with the Son of God. The true Messiah will be relieved, revealed to them, O oh Father. Spirit of the living God, I pray that you will take over each and every session of Father from the first book of Matthew till the revelation, Lord, where you will show yourself with all power to them, O oh Father, even as they sit in the class, oh Lord, but you are with them, Lord. You are speaking to them. You are revealing yourself to them, Lord. The great and mighty God is next to them, O oh Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Let there be signs, wonders, and miracles in the class, O oh Father. Let them encounter you, Lord. Let the sickness be healed, O oh Father. Let them, uh, let them, uh, let your presence become tangible in the session, Lord. Let there be testimonies rising from the class, O oh Father, that they have encountered you, Lord. They have this experience of all powerful. God next to them, oh Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for revealing yourself, for showing yourself with us, Lord, because this is what your scripture talks about, Lord. When we study about you, we your presence, oh Father, because your word says, when two or three gather in my presence and call upon my name, I am there. Lord, we are more than two and three, oh Lord. We talk about you, the experience what the disciples went through, oh Father. We pray that as we study, we are able to understand and experience the same presence of God with us, Lord. Because you are Emmanuel, oh Lord. You are God with us, oh Father. You are with us, Lord. Thank you for your tangible presence, Lord. Just not for me, but for each of us where we are, Lord. May we experience you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are present. When we call upon your name, you are there. Thank you. In Jesus' most precious name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. God bless. Thank you for joining us in this session. God bless. Yeah. Thank you. Let me stop the recording.